honor to be here. I'm thrilled to be in, in Madrid at uh, Big Data Spain. And uh, I think I have some questions today to, to present. One in particular, has AI arrived? I think that this is the right kind of question to be asking now. As Oscar described, we can't exactly predict the future, but it looks like this is what's ahead. So I have some questions, and I'll start out with a rhetorical question, something to consider. Can you name 10 startups, 10 tech startups that are successful, technology companies that do not have machine learning as part of their roadmap? Because frankly, I can't. When I look around, as Oscar said, machine learning has become pervasive. And so everyone is using this. It's really arrived here in 2016. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, a lot of this talk comes from a, a longer article called Beyond the AI Winter. And uh, as you may see, some of the illustrations up here are actually using deep learning uh, to help put together the, uh, the, the illustrations for it. Now, an interesting perspective here about machine learning being pervasive. Uh, Peter Norvig is head of research at Google. He is also co-chair for a new conference series called Artificial Intelligence that O'Reilly is doing. At the most recent instance of this conference, Peter Norvig noted how Mark Andreessen, who created Netscape, the browser, Mark Andreessen also is from Andreessen Horowitz, a very powerful uh, venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. Andreessen noted very famously how software eats the world, and he's bet on this, made billions off of these bets. But now we're seeing machine learning eats the world. And so this is part of the, the core strategy for so many companies. Also, a related perspective is from Pedro Domingos. He is a professor of machine learning at the University of Washington. Uh, I've cited uh, his works in a lot of my courses and, and, uh, and books and all. Uh, Pedro Domingos has a new book out called The Master Algorithm, and I highly recommend this. Uh, I think it's a, it's a tour de force of looking throughout machine learning, looking at all the different parts, the different camps, how they fit together. Domingos believes that we're getting close to something that he calls a universal learner. This is related to the quest for unsupervised learning. It's going to take some work. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. There's an excellent quote that Domingos has in his book here. The future belongs to those who understand, at a very deep level, how to combine their unique expertise with what the algorithms can do. And so that's kind of a theme that I would like to present here today. I believe that this is one of the important questions of where we are at right now in 2016. Uh, Domingos, in his book, notably, he describes five different tribes in machine learning. There are the symbolists, the connectionists, the evolutionaries, the Bayesians, and also the, uh, the analogizers. Each of these five camps has made incredible breakthroughs over the years, and they all have requirements in terms of big data, in terms of distributed systems, frameworks that we use. They place a lot of very interesting kinds of engineering requirements on those. But one problem with machine learning is that these different camps have not historically worked together. They have not talked with each other. There's a lot of rivalry. Um, and yet we see there are indications of how they're starting to converge. On page 54, in particular, of Domingo's book, uh, there's a great slide. Uh, I'll leave that as a surprise if you check out the book. Now, related to this, over the past couple of years, deep learning has just exploded. We see so many applications of deep learning. And so among those five tribes that Pedro Domingos described, the connectionists are now prevailing. Now, this is interesting. There's a lot of excellent work that's being done with deep learning. For instance, when you look at the history of self-driving cars, there was a lot of work to engineer how to automate driving. But when neural networks uh, arranged as deep learning, when this became more feasible to, to use for self-driving cars, a lot of what had been specialized tasks in the automation of cars began to be subsumed by deep learning, and it really accelerated, it generalized the process of doing this kind of automation. So we're seeing deep learning rolling out in a lot of places. I'll show some examples of this. Even so, deep learning is not all of machine learning, and machine learning is not all of machine intelligence. 
And so I think it just begs the question, what else is missing? If we're really focused on deep learning now, what are the other parts that need to be augmented, that need to be evolved and developed? So first off, I want to show some examples. Uh, and again, we're using some deep learning here for the imagery. Uh, when we look at the major tech firms, all of these have very large AI emphasis, very large AI projects. Uh, you know, clearly what's going on with Google, a lot of AI there. Amazon has Alexa, IBM has Watson, Microsoft, Baidu, Intel, Facebook, etc. All the tech majors are investing very heavily in AI projects and bringing this out to consumers. Uh, if, I apologize, this uh, slide here I know is the type on there is very small. It's too small to read on the screen. But if you check the link, and the slides will be published, uh, this is an excellent landscape diagram uh, from a couple of friends of mine, uh, Siobhan Zillis and James Chan at Bloomberg Beta. It's a VC firm in San Francisco, and they've taken a look at, at mapping out the landscape of not just the tech majors, but the other companies that are filling in the, uh, connecting the different parts of AI. Um, who are the people who are bringing this technology out to market? And it's fascinating because there are so many. Now, in terms of specific examples, one that I really like has come out recently from Microsoft Research. They were able to reach human parity in terms of transcribing conversational speech. So if you had a recorded conversation, maybe a video, they could come out with transcripts that are exceeding the quality of human transcribers. Uh, reaching human parity, that's, that's a milestone. That's a kind of metric that we can use to assess that, yes, there is a kind of AI going on here. And at O'Reilly, certainly, we have a lot of applications for using this. I look forward to being a user for it. Now, uh, similarly, this is a paper that's still in review. It's not exactly published yet, uh, but it just came out where they're using AI for lip reading and they're about to reach human parity in terms of lip-reading. Uh, for those of you who've ever watched, one of my favorite films is 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, there's definitely a, a humorous aspect to having AI be doing uh, lip-reading. Um, but I think that realistically, when we look for examples of AI, I would point to something like the control system that is at the heart of Uber. Because what you have there is automation. It relies on a lot of different machine learning components, but Quintessentially, it's manipulating a complex supply chain for some kind of desired outcome. It's manipulating this complex supply chain that involves a lot of humans and a lot of machines. There are the drivers, there are the, the customers, there are the cars, etc. But manipulating that supply chain for the outcome of profit for Uber, obviously. And I think that we'll see that kind of effect as AI rolls out. When I was doing AI work back uh, as a grad student 30 years ago, when we talked about AI, it was in the context of planning systems, schedulers, control systems, something that's more complex having an outcome. And so I think that what we're seeing with companies like Uber, this is the shape of, of a lot of AI work going forward. Uh, in terms of art and literature, I would point to a couple of favorite examples. Uh, there is a, a short video here called Sunspring. It's a science fiction video. I think it's only nine minutes long. Uh, it's a short film, and uh, here's Elizabeth Gray, one of the actresses, lead actresses. And the interesting thing is that the actors had less than a day to prepare for this. The script was generated by deep learning. It's an AI called Benjamin. It's an LSTM, and it took in a lot of science fiction text and, and emitted a science fiction movie script. Uh, so I think it's fascinating. You definitely can tell that the, the dialogue is a little bit awkward because it was generated by a machine, but you also can tell that it's a science fiction story. And another example, too, from Flash Forward, they take uh, science fiction stories and they produce radio plays as a podcast. And then they bring in experts from a number of fields, experts from anthropology, experts from linguistics, experts from science and engineering, to deconstruct the story. And in this case, there's a story called The Witch Who Came From Mars, which was generated, again, by deep learning. Uh, it's definitely a science fiction story. It's actually a, a pretty good story. It's short, but it's another example of what AI is capable of doing at this point. So uh, at O'Reilly, we've initiated a series, a new conference series called Artificial Intelligence. The first one was in New York City in September, and we followed that up with another related event called Bot Day, uh, looking at conversational bots. Uh, that was in San Francisco in October. The next one is coming up in New York City in June, 
And the call for proposals is open through January. Uh, this will be a large event. I highly recommend it. Uh, we've been getting some excellent content. Tim O'Reilly and Peter Norvig are the co-chairs on this. Uh, when we had the event in New York City in September, as you might imagine, there was a lot of deep learning covered. But there were also other parts beyond deep learning, and that's what I'd like to address. So first off, Peter Norvig, uh, he, he brought out a theme here, that when we talk about AI systems and bringing this out to the market, it really compels a lot of sophisticated engineering. And here's an excellent talk where he's showing at Google the level of complexity of engineering, what they have to deal with. Uh, so some observations. Machine learning inherently is, it makes systems difficult to debug, it's hard to revise it incrementally, it's hard to validate, there's less transparency into the algorithms being used, it's much more difficult to isolate components to be able to debug them, and in general, it accelerates tech debt. So if you're familiar with software engineering, tech debt becomes a very crucial issue. There's a great paper here, the first one referenced machine learning, the high interest credit card of technical debt. And so it's a very important point to consider. A lot of what we're doing with cloud and with big data and with distributed systems, uh, of course, is made great use of in terms of AI. And this tech debt is, is the crux of it. Now, in contrast, Carlos Guestrin, is, he's the co-founder for a company called Dato, which was recently acquired by Apple Computer. And Carlos makes a counterpoint here. There's a system that he has called Lime, and there's a couple of talks here, one from uh, Strata and another one from KDD. And what they're doing is to use machine learning to explain more complicated machine learning models. So he's addressing some of the transparency issue of, of algorithms and effectively paying down some of that tech debt. I think we'll see more of this, AI explaining itself. So overall, the impact on big data, cloud, et cetera, the impact is that AI is driving product features, consumer product features, and this is from the major players. And when we look at this, you definitely see the cloud vendors are the ones who are making some of the biggest bets. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, et cetera. Um, they're the major players in this space. And so for those of us here at Big Data Spain, you're in the right place at the right time. This is a driver for much more consumption of what we are doing. I do believe that the major benefactors of this will be in other verticals, though. Verticals such as healthcare, manufacturing, we're seeing a lot of uptick where this is applied, as well as energy, transportation, agriculture, et cetera. Now, another point that has surfaced out of our, our conferences, this is from Genevieve Bell, who is an Intel fellow and head of user experience at Intel. She's an anthropologist by training. And from her perspective, an anthropologist would look at AI or would, would interact with AI and would ask certain questions. Who raised you? Who, who were your mothers? Who were your fathers? And as Bell has observed, AI has had a lot of fathers, perhaps too many. We need to balance that out. Uh, from an anthropologist's perspective, it's, it's good to understand who created a technology to see what parts perhaps are missing. Um, related to that, Oren Etzioni is CEO of the Allen Institute for AI. I have a couple of friends working up there, very interesting work. Uh, he makes the case that AI, machine learning in general, is mostly human work. We're addressing what are fundamentally ill-structured problems, and it requires a lot of curation, a lot of human input. So he's saying that there's really a human face to this. The machines are not exactly taking over right away. In fact, as I was introducing Oren Etzioni, he was about to get up on stage and announce that we don't have to worry about AI taking over. The machines are not taking over. And right as he was about to say it, the laptop driving the screen crashed. So I, I think that actually AI was not taking over anytime soon. Um, I am concerned, though, I, I like this kind of analysis, but I'm concerned that if we try to anthropomorphize too much, it may be a problem. Uh, it may introduce bias that is not necessary. Uh, machine intelligence is very different from how we as humans experience cognition. Uh, there is use of what's generally called abductive reasoning, which is very much not human. And as a case in point, uh, NASA, when they produce deep space probes, they use antennas that are twisted in very odd shapes. They're generated by genetic programming. They're generated by machine intelligence. These are shapes that are highly optimal for deep space probes, but they're not the kind of thing that a human engineer could devise. And so we're starting to see things that are outside the scope of what humans would typically do. 
Um, now, another aspect, of course, is about jobs, about technology displacing jobs. And so this is a question from uh, Tim O'Reilly, the founder of the company I'm at. Uh, this is a theme that he's been posing and, and trying to get this dialogue going. Will AI replace jobs? And an observation that Tim makes is that we're not going to run out of work until we run out of problems. And we're not running out of problems anytime soon. Now, there will be jobs. There will be a lot of work. It's up to us to devise whether, how fair those jobs are. And Tim makes the point that our main advances in economics globally have happened when we've made investment in the future of other people's children. And a very clear example, of course, is Reconstruction after World War II here in Europe, how there were investments and there was so much progress made in terms of infrastructure and technology and, and economics. And so that's a model for us going forward. Um, we recently had an election in the United States. I'm sure a lot of people have seen this. Uh, you may have seen this graphic here. We have a lot of states that are blue or red. Uh, for what it's worth, I'm a Westerner. I'm from California, and uh, my political views are more like California. Uh, and you may have seen this contrast, but when you look at the shape of where the red states are and the blue states are, here in contrast is another diagram uh, from NPR, and they, they have an infographic where they show what are the most popular jobs by state. And they, they roll this forward interactively from 1974, where the most popular job was secretary, almost across the United States. Up to now, in 2014, they're showing, uh, most recently when they looked at the stats, the most popular job throughout most of these states is truck driver. And so if you see the places that flipped over to red, the most popular job is truck driver. The places that flipped over to blue, the most popular job is software developer. And so there's a very deep divide between technology, the people with the technology jobs, and the people who are driving trucks. And to be fair, the US Department of Labor, maybe the way that truck driver is calculated is a little difficult. Anybody who drives a delivery truck is a truck driver. But still, the notion of being a truck driver is something that's relatively isolated from globalization. I mean, you can't take a truck driver job in Alabama and ship it to China. So it's something that's very regional, it's very local. And also people who have this skill are more mobile. They can take jobs in other regions. But the difficulty is, uh, as Matt Ako, who uh, is uh, a venture capitalist at DCVC in San Francisco, Matt Ako uh, observed that as of 2017, there are five different platforms going to market for self-driving trucks. So these jobs here, where people have flipped to the red states, where they're truck drivers, those jobs are at risk. Now, to be fair, a fully self-driving truck is still, it's still going to be a few years off. I mean, there's a lot of regulation that has to happen, a lot of laws have to change, et cetera. And, the, and they still need humans involved as far as the delivery, but those major jobs are also being displaced. Uh, now, some people contend that the economic models need updates. That, if, for instance, I've, I've pointed here, if you follow the link, there's a speculation that global economics has some inherent inflationary aspects, whereas technology causes some very abrupt deflationary aspects, and that what we're experiencing is a kind of chaos as these two interact. Uh, I think I'm, I'm not an economist, uh, economist but I, I believe that that deserves a lot more attention. And meanwhile, what it points out to you is, as AI rolls out and begins to displace, displace more jobs, people are going to need retraining, they're going to need education. But in particular, we're going to have to build out better safety nets. So in the US, we definitely have an urgent priority to be talking more about things like universal basic income. Because as we look forward to the next few years, there's really no way we can cross this bridge without it. And yet, unfortunately, in the United States, the political leadership is going exactly the opposite direction. Um, okay, back to technology. Uh, some of the other themes that have surfaced recently is about deep learning and just how pervasive deep learning is. Here is a, a link to Jan LeCun. He is one of the, uh, sort of the grandfathers of, uh, of AI, of deep learning. He's one of the people who really helped invent the field, and he's head of AI at uh, Facebook. Uh, Jan makes a, a really good talk about the different components required for AI systems. You have perception, 
such as vision recognition systems. You have predictive models, of course, what we do a lot. You have memory, LSTMs. You have reasoning and planning, also based on recurrent neural networks. And so all of these kind of components, according to Yan LeCun, can be addressed with deep learning. But I do think there's a risk here. Uh, there's an excellent paper uh, by a friend, Jimmy Lin, that came out a few years ago. Uh, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And Jimmy was talking about MapReduce being used in algorithms at scale, how people were just using MapReduce over and over, thinking that they had a hammer, so every problem looked like a nail. And I, I think there is a risk right now that we apply deep learning too much as the hammer looking for nails. Perception, prediction, memory, these are all necessary, but they don't address understanding. And so as an example, there's something called Winograd schemas, actually very short examples of sentences, which you cannot really parse with machine learning without having additional context about the rest of the world. You need to have common sense reasoning, you need to have contextual understanding, and there's a, there's a great paper here by Hector Levesque uh, that goes into uh, you know, what's needed for, for solving uh, or addressing a Winograd schema. And so this point about common sense reasoning, context, that without ample knowledge of the world, you really can't understand what is being parsed. Uh, this points to what has been kind of two warring factions in AI for the past few decades. On the one hand, you had the people doing embodied cognition, led primarily by one of my former professors, Rodney Brooks. Uh, and the idea was that AI needed to explore its world by being inside of mobile robots that could go out and experience the world. But on the other side, uh, also one of my professors, my, my graduate advisor, Doug Lennon, was leading a school about ontology. Uh, and it's more difficult, it's a lot longer road, but I think it pays off better. And we're seeing that embodied cognition had prevailed for a long time, but now with a lot of the, the rollout of deep learning, the people doing ontology are beginning to get more of an upper hand. Um, and to that, I would point to a system called Eurisco. This was from Doug Lennett, and it, this was done back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, but when we talk about the class of systems of, of cognitive computing, like IBM Watson, or Amazon Alexa, or Google Brain, or Apple Siri, when we talk about that class of, of AI systems, uh, Eurisco was one of the first to have that level of complexity. So as an example, uh, Doug Lennett had fed the rules of circuit design, NMOS circuitry. He'd fed those into Eurisco and then asked a question, can you design the minimum size RAM circuit, memory cell, uh, in circuit design. And Eurisco came back with a very startling answer. It said, yes, it's a Mobius strip. Now, the thing is that when we talk about doing circuit design, we think about planar 2D circuits. But Eurisco had no constraint for 2D. So it imagined doing circuit design in 3D and came out with this very startling uh, prediction that a Mobius strip would be the minimum memory cell. There's a lot of other examples. Uh, people like John Seeley Brown from Xerox Park, people like Don Knuth from Stanford, and others went in and analyzed what was going on with Eurisco. And they found out some very fascinating things, uh, but they realized they were hitting a wall. And this was back in the mid-'80s. Uh, they realized that without the, the contextual understanding, without the common sense reasoning, that learning and rules and patterns could only go so far. So, Doug Lennett went off and created a company called Psych, which has been doing this ontology work, common sense reasoning, now for more than 30 years. And uh, the upper ontology of Psych, it's called OpenPsych. It's released as open source. It was actually used as part of the, uh, the initial work developing IBM Watson. It's used, we're using it some at, uh, in O'Reilly. Anyway, there's a couple papers here about Eurisco. I think there's a lesson to learn here about deep learning, about where are we right now at 2016, and where are we going forward, I think we're going to hit a similar kind of wall as Lennett had seen more than 30 years ago. And that will be a shift more towards balancing out between these different five tribes that uh, Pedro Domingos identifies. So here's the thing. When you're doing machine learning, you make an assumption that there is structure inside of your data. We look at big data and we say, yes, there is structure, there is some kind of signal, and if we use the right analysis, we can, uh, we can verify that that signal exists. So we create learners, we create machine learning models, we run them to validate that the structure exists. But we do not have a lot of tooling to actually show what is the structure in the data. 
So that's been a question. That's been something that I think has really been overlooked. Um, there are new kinds of tools that are coming out to try to identify structure in data. And it's much less ad hoc than what we've seen in the past with big data. Um, for instance, there's some great uh, works here. Chad Topaz uh, writing about topological data analysis, TDA, homology. One problem, of course, with TDA is that it's very computationally expensive. But uh, for those of us here working in big data, working in distributed systems, working in cloud, computationally expensive is no hay uno problema. We like to hear about problems that are computationally expensive because we know that that curve drops over time. Um, whoops, sorry. At O'Reilly, whoops, sorry here. At O'Reilly, we have an AI project. I direct some teams that are working on a fairly large AI project now. And the thing is that O'Reilly, we publish books. We work with a lot of high-tech companies, but we're not a high-tech company. But yet, what we found was that the, the, current, uh, the current generation of AI tooling, really off the shelf, open source even, uh, was what was necessary to unlock the value of data that we have. And that without that, we really couldn't make use of that data. I think there's a lesson learned there. I think we'll see this more, that the AI tools are much more complex and require a lot of sophisticated engineering and a lot of integration, but they unlock the value of the data. Now, the project that we're working on, it does make use of Spark and Mesos and Kubernetes and Docker and the devil you know. All the things that we're working with uh, are applied to this, but there are some other subtle points that we're missing. Um, what we found as we were doing our initial research was that the way that customers interact with O'Reilly, such as through online search, it's a very constrained vocabulary. The natural language requirements on this really break down to about a little over 12,000, almost 13,000 lexemes. That's not a large number. Now, for an individual, for an editor, for an engineer, trying to understand all of the major themes that are current in design, DevOps, machine learning, uh, software architecture, uh, data-driven business, trying to go across all these different areas and understand what are the major themes going on, it's too much for any one individual, any engineer, any, any editor. But those concepts are not too much for a small cluster. And so this is where we see where the automation really has value that the humans can't handle. And that the, the break point there is about cognitive load. Um, and this is related to something that Peter Norvig has, has pointed out called the inattention valley. Um, so the challenge that we've faced and what we think that a lot of people will be facing is that on the one hand, we use big data, we use machine learning, we have these tools and frameworks that can generate a very large graph. And so empirically, we can take all of our content, we can take a chapter of one book and calculate a jacquard similarity to a chapter of another book and create a graph in between them. That's a very empirical approach. It's a kind of implied graph. But what we really need is something up above that that's a very explicit graph that's curated by humans. That is much more useful for making queries, for being able to do search rewrites, for being able to do recommendations, and other types of very critical analysis. And so the problem that we have faced and what we think a lot of people will face is maintaining a kind of structural integrity between these two graphs. The empirical one that's generated by the tools and then the more rationalized one that's generated by human curation up above. So there's sort of a solve a coagula problem there of keeping these two in sync. And there's not a lot of tooling yet for these. We hope that that kind of tooling emerges. Um, to close, I'll point to an excellent talk that I think summarizes a lot of this uh, by a friend, David Beyer at Amplify Partners. And uh, David is a VC, he's an investor in Silicon Valley. And he, he had this excellent talk here a few months ago about how AI is reshaping global industries. And as an investor, as a VC, really what is his scorecard for looking at particular verticals and looking at particular new companies and seeing are they really ready to make the shift into AI? Um, in particular, David points out about a century ago when you look at the transition from steam power to electric power, it took a generation for that narrative to complete. It took a generation because the people who built factories coming from steam power, they kept designing this way. Even though they had electrical generators, they would still design the factory layout as if they still had steam. It took a generation for those people to swap out of the workforce before we could really transition from steam to electric. 
Now, we're seeing that AI is very much quicker adoption, but there are similar extremes of cognitive embrace, of really understanding what it is that the machines do versus what the people do. And so I, I pose this as a challenge. I believe that we, need to, we have an obligation to distinguish between what humans and computers can do well, respectively. The humans are much better at managing large-scale cognitive load, being able to handle the speed, the scale, the repeatability, uh, these things we know from big data. The humans, however, are much better at curation. And so being able to distinguish between that is important. The organizations that focus on building that expertise for AI applica applications, I believe, will have a distinct advantage. And I believe that all of us here, that we are in the right place at the right time. Uh, it's very exciting to see what is rolling out. I wish you very well, and thank you very much.